So thank you all for being here, for joining us to learn how to give testimony and to speak up for fair voting maps for the people of Pennsylvania. I am Carol Cunningham. I'm chair of Fair Districts PA, and I appreciate that you are willing to give time to engage with this important effort. And it's really important for citizens to give time, to understand the issue and to speak up. It's only as we call attention to this that we have a guarantee of getting better maps this time than we have in the past. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what redistricting is briefly. Some of you know a lot about this topic. Some of you are new to it. So we're gonna talk about what it is, why it matters. Then we're gonna talk about what giving testimony is, um, what to include when you give testimony, how to think about districts that you're gonna talk about. We're gonna hear some sample testimonies from folks from different parts of the state. Uh, talk a little bit about next steps, and then we are going to do breakouts by region. So start starting out with redistricting. Every 10 years after the census data is released to the states, congressional and state legislative districts are redrawn since districts are required to have roughly equal populations. The data will, some of the data will be given to states in the middle of August. The rest of it, the final data in cleaned up version will be given to states the end of September. Uh, we don't know for sure when Pennsylvania will say that the data is ready to use because there have to be some changes made to it once it's released. This is a really important issue, how these district lines are drawn. I'll be honest, I had never heard of this. I had never heard about redistricting or gerrymandering until about five, six years ago. And, and what I've discovered is this has huge impact on far more than I ever imagined. How district lines are drawn influences who runs for office and who is elected. And it, they influence whether elected officials are responsive to community needs or whether they ignore us completely. So think about the things you care about, the issues that matter to you, district lines impact all of that a great deal more than you might think. Now, how are the district lines done? Congressional districts, those are the folks who go to the US House of Representatives. That is, um, those we have 18 of those and we are losing one, we'll have 17. Um, once the new lines are drawn. The, the map is drawn as a, it's introduced as a bill in our state legislature. It's passed by the legislature. The state government committee chairs have promised to hold hearings this summer. And we just learned today that there is a hearing scheduled for early August. I'll give you the date later. We don't actually know though who draws the map. In the past, they have had hearings. They have allowed people to speak. What people have said has had no bearing at all on the map that was drawn. So we don't really know who draws the map um, and we don't have any guarantee that what we say will have an impact. We do know that the bill once passed by the House and Senate is signed or vetoed by the governor. And that is a reassuring fact in this particular cycle. Um, because the legislature is one party, the governor is another party, that is a really good safeguard on the process, a good check and balance. We still need to speak up to say what we wanna see in the map as it's drawn, but we know it won't be as badly gerrymandered as it's been done in the past. State House and Senate districts, those are done by a five person legislative reapportionment commission, four legislative leaders and a chair, Mark Nordenberg. For the first time ever, there are two women on the commission. And for the first time ever, there is a person of color on the commission. Mark Nordenberg, the chair has promised hearings in July and August. And again, when final census data is available. Uh, he hasn't announced, they haven't announced when those hearings will be, but we're, we are hopeful that um, there will be hearings and we're hopeful that it will be a more fair process than in the past. Mark Nordenberg appears to be respected by people across the political spectrum. And he's made indications that he really does want to do this fairly. And he um, wants to have the maps represent the people of Pennsylvania. Will that be the case? Um, we're hopeful, but there's no guarantee. Um, it's important to remember that the legislature does not have a final vote on the maps that are drawn by this commission. They have the final say. The governor can't veto it. The legislature doesn't approve it. These five people will decide for us what our maps will be for the next 10 years. And really, they'll be deciding for us our political landscape for the next 10 years. Those maps will control a great deal of what happens in Pennsylvania over the next decade. The congressional map, uh, congressional map, there's really no rules other than that they'd be very even in population. 
state house and senate districts the rules are set by the pennsylvania constitution that says districts must be composed of compact and contiguous territory as nearly equal in population as practicable unless absolutely necessary no county city town borough township or ward shall be divided in forming a senatorial or representative district now if we look at our state house and senate maps and i encourage you to do that and we'll give you some links to do that um, if you look at our maps, you'll see that, that those guidelines, those rules that are in our state constitution have been ignored flagrantly, um, completely, regularly ignored. And just you know, a little sample from Western PA, you can see that Senate uh, House District 10 in Lawrence County, there are parts of that that are not contiguous to the district itself. Uh, you can look across the state and you'll see places where communities are cracked into multiple uh, districts, both House and Senate districts. Uh, most of our uh, community, our state college campuses, uh, the town, our college towns across the state, many of our college towns, uh, this one here at the top is Slippery, um, slippery Rock. Um, many of those, those districts in Butler County, many of those district uh, areas are splintered out um, to control the outcome of elections. And that brings us to this important word, gerrymandering, manipulation of electoral maps for political advantage. So imagine you have a, 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 little, a little state that has uh, three districts, 60% uh, blue wards or precincts, 40% gray wards or precincts, and blue, uh, if, if they drew the lines in the way that uh, first graphic shows, um, blue could win all three. Um, there's some possibility of competition, a little bit, um, but blue could could take the complete um, all of that, and gray would have zero representation in the legislature. Now, if somehow gray got to draw the lines, they could draw it in a way that they packed all the blue into one district, left some blue in the gray districts, and gray could actually get a majority in the legislature, even though they have a minority of, of wards. And that's been the case in Pennsylvania for 20 years. Republicans have been the ones to draw the map, even though they have, um, in terms of registered voters, less, um, less registered voters, and they have managed to maintain a, a strong majority most of the last 20 years in the Pennsylvania House and Senate. Another way that it could be done is, uh, this is actually a kind of a sweetheart gerrymander that um, the blues all put themselves in two safe districts for themselves, put the gray in one very safe district for gray. Um, it's a proportional outcome, so you end up with two blue and one gray, which is mathematically correct, but they're also very safe seats. So when you think about gerrymandering, it's important to remember there are always at least two games going on, and one of those is to grab partisan advantage. So somebody wants to, everybody wants to get charge, in charge of the mapping process so that they can draw the maps to make sure that they have the majority for the next decade. That's an important goal. Another one though is, um, oh, I went the wrong direction. Another one is to protect incumbents on both sides. So that last graphic that I showed, um, the legislators do some work to make sure that they have safe seats and their favored um, incumbents have safe seats. And it happens on both sides. Not everybody gets a safe seat, but many of our legislators have safe seats, have safe seats, have safe seats and many have, stayed in office a very long time because it's almost impossible for anybody to run against them. And there's also, gerrymandering can also be used to punish incumbents who don't do as they're told. And we know legislators who've been told, do this or we'll write you off the map, do this or we'll make it very difficult for you in the next election. Um, they've also been drawn to um, block competitors. Uh, there was a, a district that I knew there was a strong competitor and, and the district was drawn almost as a donut around his own where he lived so that he was no longer in the district where he stood a good chance of winning in the next election. So we wanna speak out against that. That's what we're here tonight to do, to speak out against gerrymandering, to advocate for maps that represent us rather than hold legislators in safe seats for decades at a time, or give partisan advantage to the party that drew the maps. So we wanna speak out, advocacy is our opportunity to do that. Um, testimony is our op opportunity to do that. And part of what it does, it creates a legal record. So we're going on record saying, this is what we want to see, this is what we don't want to see. Um, it calls attention to specific areas of concern. So we're saying, we know you did this, and we're saying, don't do this again, and hoping that we're heard. 
Um, it lets decision makers know that we're watching. And this is really important. In the past, many times the maps have been drawn kind of in, in secret. Well, we know they're drawn in secret, but if there aren't lots of people paying attention, sometimes that secrecy is, um, get they get away with it. And our goal is to say, you're not gonna get away with it. We're watching, um, we care, we want these maps to be done right. And it builds a lot of pressure for fair maps. That is our goal, to build pressure for fair maps. So we need lots and lots of people all across the state saying, we demand fair maps and we know what good maps look like and we know for sure what bad maps look like. So there's two kinds of testimony. One is oral testimony. It's spoken in a public setting, often called a hearing. Uh, frequently there's a time limit. We're gonna assume a two minute time limit unless we hear it differently. Um, usually you sign up to speak. Um, you might sign up online or you might show up in person and um, sign up there, and then you're called in order. Uh, usually you're recorded, and usually public testimony is one way. Um, there's not usually questions. Occasionally there's a comment, but usually it's a one-way thing. And oral testimony right now in this Zoom world we live in can be in person in public meetings, or it actually can be in Zoom meetings, um, both, both are possible. And then there's written testimony, and that's a document that can be submitted to decision makers in this case, it would be the committee, the state government committee, or the legislative reapportionment commission, um, or it could be sent as an. It, it, it can be the document can be sent as an email to those entities, or sometimes they will have an online portal, or they might have an online form. We don't know yet if they're going to offer any of that. Um, we'll be watching. Um, it can also be longer, unless there's a form that limits the, the length. Uh, often it can be longer, and it can include more detail and documentation. So if you wanted to include maps or photos, if you wanted to tell a longer story, written testimony is a good thing to do. And we're gonna be really encouraging folks to do both. Um, the more record we have, the better. Um, and we will also be talking about ways that we could provide um, an access through our website for people to submit testimony that we can make public, no matter what the Legislative Reapportionment Commission does or the um, state government committees. So we're encouraging people to think about doing both forms of testimony. Now, how do you do testimony? What are the components? What are the building blocks for success? Well, one is credentials. And that really means just, who are you? So I'm Carol Cunningham. I live in Chester County. I've lived here for 23 years. I have voted in every general election since I moved here 23 years ago. And I am a member of the League of Women Voters. I am the chair of Fair Districts PA. I think voting is really important. Why, why am I here? What am I talking about? Well, the critical point for me is that elections should matter and who I vote for should matter. And sometimes it feels like I have no say. Um, I have had elections where there's been no opposition on the ballot, where there's only one choice. That's, that to me is not an election. And I've seen how discouraged voters can be when there is no choice on the ballot or when they can't even figure out who their legislators are, who their choices are. Um, to me, that's really important. Tell a story. So here's a story. I worked at a polling place where there were two different ballots and the poll workers were trying to figure out why are there two different ballots? And, and some people got one ballot and some got the other. And it was very complicated, very confusing. Voters were frustrated. Why are there two different ballots? And the poll workers didn't actually know. Later, when I looked at the district, I realized, well, there's two house districts in one precinct. That makes no sense. And what I discovered was the precinct was divided between two house districts and the town itself was divided between two precincts. That's a problem. Provide evidence and list consequences. Well, the consequence of the story I just told is that voters were confused and frustrated. Uh, another piece of evidence is my school district is divided into five different house districts and it makes it really hard to hold candidate forums. It makes it hard to get representation for the school. Uh, so that is another issue that I have evidence and could list consequences. And then there's an ask. So my ask would be, please don't draw districts that divide precincts. Please don't draw districts that divide school districts. And when you do have to divide a township or a county because of the numeric necessity, could you put in a report why you chose to divide it, where you chose to divide it? That would be my ask for this. So be personal and specific. Build on your own, what brought me here? Why are you concerned? What, what caught your attention? What made you care about this? Build on that. Tell about your own district, your own community, and or the larger picture, the impact on voters when districts are distorted. So you can get very personal, uh, very local, 
or you can look at the larger picture or a little bit of both and consider using visuals depending on the situation, maps, photos, graphs. So in part, we want to think this evening about districts. If we're gonna talk about districts, what we wanna see with districts, we need to look at districts um, and we should start with some questions. So we're gonna look a little bit at South Central PA just for a few minutes um, and what seems odd. So to me, when I, I, I spend a lot of time looking at maps and I spend a lot of time looking at odd things and saying, now, why is that that way? And so the thing that strikes me most here, there's a district over here that's very odd, uh, that crosses a mountain where there's no road, that's odd. But another thing that's odd to me is why is Dauphin County divided into two districts and why do both districts cross the Susquehanna River? That just seems kind of odd. Um, where are the county lines? Well, you can see the county lines here and you can see in lots of ways that the district lines have nothing to do with the county lines. And then does your county have more districts than it should? The bill that we were supporting, um, LACRA, the Legislative and Congressional Redistricting Act, had a, had a minimum, had, had a, a maximum number that you could do. So sometimes because of numbers, you have to divide a county. Um, but La the LACRA bill said you can't divide it more than mathematically necessary plus one for congressional or Senate plus two for the House districts. And these are Senate districts that we're looking at here. And so Dauphin County by number, so 278,000 is approximate for the Senate districts. By number, Dauphin County could easily fit inside of one district, instead it's in two. Well, that's one plus, you know, it's plus one, that's okay. Um, but Cumberland County could easily fit inside of one district. And instead it's divided into three. That's one more than we would say is appropriate when you're drawing a map. And then York should have two and that is divided into four. So again, that's, that's more. And when you look at a region that has a lot of that going on, you say, uh, there's, there's, some, there's some deliberate gerrymandering going on. There's some attempt to get partisan advantage. Um, there's some problems here. But we can ask some more questions. So more questions. Does the district represent geographic boundaries? And so if we look at this, what we see is um, it crosses the Susquehanna River in a place where there's actually no bridge. And why would a district be crossing a wide river in a place where there's no bridge? Um, doesn't make sense. Um, and and should, should, the bridge, should the river itself be a barrier? That's a question to consider. Um, another question is where's the legislator's office? So in this case, Senator Chris Gebhardt's office newly elected in a recent special election. His office is in Lebanon, PA, Lebanon City, PA, and it's an hour from the farthest point in York. So it's right in the middle of Lebanon, um, but it's very far from other parts of the district. So that's something to think about. Um, what about school districts? So this district, Senate District 48, divides one school district in Dauphin County, and it divides three school districts in York County. There's, there's uh, West Shore is divided in half. And then you can see um, two more districts here in uh, Central York and York Suburban are divided. And, then, and if that happens, then you have to ask, do the people in your community know who their legislators are? I, I know for the League of Women Voters, when there's too many, too many districts, it's really hard to hold candidate forms. When districts go wandering into other counties, then you've got to work with the other counties to hold candidate forms. It becomes more and more difficult as you have more and more pieces of legislators. And the legislators don't want to do multiple forms. So they just look at the map and they say, well, my district goes through three different counties. So I guess I'm not going to do any forums at all. And voters are that much more distanced from their legislators and have that much more trouble understanding who they're voting for. Uh, one more thing to look at is data. So before 2011, Dauphin County was the largest part of Senate District 15. So all of Dauphin County was inside Senate District 15. Now Dauphin County is divided between Senate 15 and Senate 48. And Senate District 15 before was a Democratic Senate, it was a Democratic senator who represented it. Um, he was a real reformer um, and there was an effort to have him disappear. And the best way to have him disappear was also a, a way to create partisan advantage for the party drawing the map. So by dividing Harrisburg, this blue, uh, this pretty densely populated blue area in half, um, it created two districts that are now Republican districts and basically disenfranchised all of Harrisburg. 
in that in that one effort. It's important to remember when you look at these, um, the you know, land doesn't vote, people do, and often our blue areas are pretty densely populated and our red areas tend to be much less populated. So you can't, you might look at that and say, well, those are just little tiny areas of blue. If they're very dense and the red is very unpopulated, um, it, it makes a big difference. So do legislators seem to listen to voters in their district? Are the things voters care about addressed? One last um, thing for, for Dauphin County is it's to look at population. So Lebanon County makes up just over half of Senate District 48. Dauphin makes 23%, York is 24%. So if you were a legislator, you might feel perfectly comfortable putting your district office in the middle of Lebanon, um, appealing to the people of Lebanon and ignoring the people of Dauphin and York pretty much completely. So our first testimony is going to be from Sandra Thompson, um, who is going to uh, tell us, she's going to give her testimony using the, what we discussed earlier. Um, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about Senate District 48 and Sandra, you are on. Good evening. Thank you for this invitation to testify in favor of fair district mapping. I am Sandra Thompson, a mother, a grandmother, and an attorney. I work to open doors and provide equity and inclusion for communities who have so often been overlooked and disenfranchised. I live in Springsbury Township, York County, in the 48th Senatorial District. Senator Chris Gebhardt is now my senator. His home office is in Lebanon County, an hour from my home. It's closer to travel to the Capitol. I was a candidate to become the Democratic nominee for 2021 special election for the 48th Senatorial District. Through that process, I spoke to people in York and Dauphin counties who stated they never saw their state senator in their community. Early 2021, the total registered voters were around 175,000 in that district. 90,000 were registered voters from Lebanon County and the other 85,000 were registered voters from York and Dauphin counties. For the 48th Senatorial District, because Lebanon County makes up half of the district, York and Dauphin counties are disregarded as candidates and as voters. So these communities become lost and forgotten resulting in a lack of interest in voting. Therefore, on behalf of the residents, potential candidates, and voters of the 48th Senatorial District in all of Pennsylvania, I ask all Pennsylvania legislators to heed the call of the citizens and organizations like Fair Districts PA, who ask you to now bridge the gap by placing people over politics. It is time we give power back to the people to choose who will serve them rather than allowing those in power to remain in power by cherry picking those most likely to vote for them, gerrymandering out any who may present a valid challenge or a dissenting voice or progressive ideals. I ask you to end gerrymandering and to provide fair district mapping to assure equitable legislation and equitable representation throughout Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that. And you could hear her, um, her tell us who she is, tell us why this matters, give us some facts about the location, um, the district that she's in, and make a very clear ask. Don't do this anymore. Make sure that our districts are drawn in a way that represents us. So thank you so much for that. that. We're going to hear now from Debbie Trudeau. She is our um, one of our leaders in Center County. She's going to talk a little bit about her experience of looking at her maps, and then she's going to give um, some sample testimony uh, for both congressional and house. And it's important to remember that we have different audiences. So congressional maps are done by the legislature. The state government committees are going to be the ones holding hearings. So if, if you give testimony to those committees, it needs to be focused specifically on congressional maps. If you're gonna give testimony on house or Senate maps, you're gonna to wanna to give that testimony um, to the Legislative Reapportionment Commission. So, so we're gonna encourage you to write two separate pieces of testimony, one focused on congressional maps, one focused on House or Senate maps and submit those in different places. So Debbie's gonna kind of demonstrate how that works, uh, looking at congressional maps, House maps, and then giving us testimony uh, for both. So Debbie, you're on. My name is Debbie Trudeau. I live in State College in Center County, Congressional District 12. I'm a volunteer with the Center County Fair Districts PA chapter since 2017. 
I'm here today because Pennsylvania has been constantly cracked and packed into congressional districts that diminish our voice in elections. I am tired of hyperpartisan legislators from gerrymandered safe districts who ignore constituents outside their party, who, who pander to the caucus leadership and extremists in their party, ignoring the rest of their constituents. We all suffer from the effect on the state economy. Pennsylvania's significant population loss in the northern rural areas is a symptom of this disease. I want congressional boundaries that respect our geography, roads, and existing government entities. State College is the largest town in our county. It has dense neighborhoods with large clusters of apartments that serve our Penn State University students, staff, and research institutions. We have the only hospital in the county. Our center region council of governments and our state college area school district encompasses the state college borough and the five adjacent townships. Despite the 2018 remedial districts, the current lines for Congress split my neighborhood between congressional districts 12 and 15. Perhaps this was done by the California special master following an instruction to respect township lines. The problem is that those lines were drawn in 1801 through open land. In 2021, they have nothing to do with the layout of our region. The line splits our dense neighborhood, going through cul-de-sacs, single houses and apartments, and our school district. While not an intentional gerrymander, the effect is the same. I want an open process with public input at hearings and publicly available data before maps are finalized so we can help flag boundaries that are protective of incumbents, impractical or unnecessarily divisive. Thank you, Debbie. So she's going to now talk us through quickly um, the, the map that, and if she were doing this herself, she could, she could put maps with her testimony to share if she, if she chose to do this, but she's going to talk us through the map for the congressional districts. Okay, so I made an effort to have my comments basically be what I'm going to tell you now. Um, these are huge rural areas of the state. The population is very, very sparse. Um, you get into Center County, doesn't look too bad on paper until you dig deeper. So next, please. So this is State College. And you can see, looking at the roads, it's one pretty good sized community. There's a highway around the north side. Uh, the main arterials make a giant X through the center of town. We have a national airport in our little town and a hospital, as I said earlier. Um, our southern region uh, is the Council of Governments, a COG, that shares parks, libraries, recycling codes, and more. If we were allowed to incorporate larger areas, this would be all of State College. This is our zip code area, um, and it includes all of our school district. Okay, so there we are. The school district is split between uh, 15 and 12, and when we dig deeper, we see that along that lovely straight line, there's all kinds of shenanigans going on. So we're gonna dig even deeper. And here you see three little streets coming down from the north of the map. And those are cul-de-sacs. And there are homes at the end of each cul-de-sac that are in a different district from the rest of their neighbors. Then we have this apartment complex which is all on one side of a street, but the line does not respect the street. And then we have a retirement. Okay, uh, this is uh, student housing, same situation. We have Viro Boulevard there, but all of this housing is not in a single district. Then we have uh, the village at Penn State, a very uh, wonderful retirement community. And there too, uh, the homes are in two different districts. So this to me makes no sense. It followed the letter of the law by respecting that township line, but it's a bad idea. So what I wanna see are boundaries that respect the geography, mountains, hills, and roads and neighborhoods and have public hearings so that we can go in and say, no, you just need to tweak these lines a little and put all these people in the same place. So that's my rant. Um, then I'll, let's see, I'll, I'll start here with the slides since we're here. So now our house districts, uh, we have four different 
districts that meet right in State College. And that's, again, no accident. Um, it's a, a very densely populated, uh, very liberal cluster. Uh, again, we have our Council of Governments and we have our school district. And here you see the partisan breakup. So we lean pretty heavily to the left, no problem there. But this is what's happened in the, this recent cycle in 2011 and the cycle before in 2001. Penn State College has been split apart uh, very deliberately. And let's see, we're back to the school district being split up by those three different representatives. And as Carol said earlier, it's a problem because no one person is really keeping an eye out for us. They've got other things on their mind and they are a whole bunch of other split school districts in our county. I don't think there's anybody that has one single district in their district. So again, my, my favorite, I go digging into those cul-de-sacs to look for places where the lines make no sense. And this particular line doesn't follow a township line. This is just right smack in the middle of a, a single neighborhood. There's one road in and this is what they got out of the house districts. So again, I'm uh, eager to see public hearings. And I think, okay, so the, my, my other issue, uh, as Carol said about a river um, going through the middle of a district, here we have a mountain ridge and yes, you can go around it, but it's a pretty big barrier. And our valley has very little to do with the next valley over. Our representative, Rich Urban, lives in Huntingdon, which is about in the center of that map. Um, and we, we've talked to him. He agrees uh, that his district makes no sense. He has co-sponsored every single bill we've put up for reform. And as you can say, it's gone nowhere. But so now we're talking to the map drawers. And we're going to stop there. And Debbie is going to give us her testimony for house maps. OK. so. Uh, I start the same way. I'm here because I want elections to carry real possibilities for change. I'm tired of Pennsylvania hyperpartisan, unresponsive legislators who are protected from their voters by gerrymandering. I'm tired of sloppy one-sided bills quickly passed with neither hearings nor public support, while other bills with strong bipartisan and public support, like redistricting reform are either ignored or sabotaged. We have the powerful president, Senator, President Pro Tem and the House Majority Leader who prioritize party caucus over constituents. They rarely support bipartisan legislation with broad public support. They sponsor almost no significant bills. Meetings are difficult to schedule and are frustrating when pawned off to ill-informed staff. Our current districts carve up neighborhoods and school communities. None of our four local representatives cover a complete school district. The state college area school district is divided between three legislators. Our splits ignore geography. My district house 81 takes a quarter of state college and puts it in a district that runs 80 miles south into Huntington County on the other side of a mountain ridge with no roads. The counties share minimal common economic interests. Representative Rich Irvin, who lives in Huntington, agrees that his sister makes no sense and has co-sponsored every reform bill since 2017. What I want are public input at hearings at the county level to flag problems in preliminary maps. I want districts that ignore incumbent protection and respect constituent communities. And I want districts that respect geographic barriers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Debbie. So you heard, you heard her introduction of herself, uh, the reasons that she's concerned, uh, evidence, um, and a very specific, um, very powerful ask in each of those. So thank you. We're going to talk briefly about Philadelphia, um, some of our urban districts, um, and, and we're talking about, you know, as we look at maps, what do we see, what concerns us, and sometimes we're not really sure what we see. And, and Philadelphia is one of those places, um, Pittsburgh area has some of this, you think, well, they didn't do this for partisan advantage, did they? Because so much of the district is um, already 
blue. So what are those weird districts for? And then if you do look at the partisan data, you see, well, yeah, there is some attempt here to carve out um, red districts, even in a very blue area. And it's, it's um, you know, so you look at some of these districts and you say, yeah, they actually are trying to do that, aren't they? Um, and right here, um, you can see a couple of them, but that's only a few. If you look at the heart of the, of the city though, you say there's still a lot of weird stuff going on there that partisan advantage really has nothing to do with what's happening there. So another question could be, is this, is this an effort to create majority minority districts? And those are districts where the majority of voters are people of color. And, and when you look at the demographics of Philadelphia, again, you say, well, maybe there's a few districts where they're trying to do that, but um, then they've got, you know, people of color packed into districts with 95%. You, you have trouble seeing the, the data here, but if you dug into the data more, you'd say, um, this is more packing than it is um, creating majority minority districts. Um, so the, the part of the reality is, and I know people, um, legislators who have heard their their colleagues in Philadelphia arguing over who gets particular neighborhoods because they have donors who live in those neighborhoods or they have family members who live in those neighborhoods or you know well I grew up in that neighborhood so I need to have that neighborhood in my district because they like me. Um, there's some of that going on. So some of these districts um, are definitely drawn to protect incumbents, um, and it's important to ask questions of people who who have been there or listen to stories. Look at the maps and then think about what would it take to make sure that all of our communities are well heard and what can we do to help make sure that that happens. Um, our own districts might be okay or we might be able to see what happened in our own districts, but are there neighborhoods around us where, where the districts are even worse and where people are maybe um, not aware that, that this is something that they can speak out on? Um, how can we make sure that people are heard? So we're gonna hear a few more testimonies and then I'm gonna give you a few next steps um, and we're gonna um, break into breakouts. So uh, the next testimony is um, Ta Tam Tamara Peace from Philadelphia County. Um, and she actually has a few maps that she's going to share as part of her testimony. So I'm gonna leave the um, screen share on. Tamara, Tamara, you are, um, you are on. Uh, I am a long uh, time resident of Philadelphia. I came here as a student back in the 90s. Uh, my family is from Philadelphia, going back many generations to the 19th century. We have been here a long time. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about two districts that are actually adjacent to my district, which is the 191. Um, I'm gonna talk about the 190th and the 188. Um, the 190th, um, as you can see, is on the map at this point. And I'm gonna draw your attention to the southernmost piece that, um, thank you, uh, that uh, there's a rectangular piece and a square piece that is coming down at the bottom. And the square piece is of particular interest to me because that is where my family home exists. I have been going to that home since I was a small child. I know just about everyone that's still living on that on those blocks. Old Mr. Johnson is now in his 90s. Um, and I've seen many generations of people come and go. Um, so it has personal you know, meaning to me, of course. Um, it is connected to neighborhoods known as Garden Court and Walnut Hill. Um, these are neighborhoods that are, if you will, communities of interest. They have historical, cultural, economic, uh, connections to one another that go way back, uh, as far back as 100 years. And yet, both this area, this square area, and its adjacent area that includes um, the rectangular piece that begins to move into Cobbs Creek, um, have been linked to the 190. And I do not understand this. Um, it looks to me as though the boundary of the 190th should be, I believe that is uh, Market Street, that big long uh, diagonal street that is going from one end, thank you, from one end of um, when you cross the Schuylkill all the way out to West Philadelphia. That seems like a natural boundary. Um, 
I'm not going to say that I have any, I'm not casting any aspersions as to why this was done. I'm just asking the question. I'm putting it out there because I know that these communities are significantly different from one another, have different needs, have different um, uh, just histories. And when I have done just an informal polling of the people who live now in the area that my, it's now my mother living in that house, um, many of the younger people who have moved in do not know who their representative is. And these are younger people. These are people who are going to be staying in the area, raising their families. And that concerns me greatly. Um, could we go to the next slide if it's the 188? It, this makes it a little bit clearer. Um, that square piece that's been carved out, that piece is the piece that I believe belongs to the 188. And I would make an argument that it is a community of interest and it belongs with the 188. If there is a good reason for it not to have been included, I'd like to know what that is. So my ask is that as the LRC commission goes forward, that they take into serious consideration community integrity and include community input um, and community historical understanding of their neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. And, and you did bring in the whole, you know, communities, history, economics, you know, what do we share? That's an important piece to think through um, as you work on this, you know, who, who are the people that share or should share um, information, economics, um, and have the same goals, the same purposes, and how do they make sure that they're being heard and they're being represented well? And when those communities are splintered as they are, it's almost impossible to have that happen. We're going to next hear from our last, um, our last um, sample testimony from Rich Rafferty, who is in Montgomery County. And I do want to uh, let everybody know that Montgomery County, our belief is that it's the most, based on the 2011 maps, was the most gerrymandered county by far in Pennsylvania. So taking that together with the 50 plus events that I've personally uh, attended or engaged in with fair districts, uh, mostly in Montgomery County. And I would ask the LRC looking at you directly that here's what comes to mind. How could you possibly support the current redistricting process when you have three factors in play? Number one, you have our elected officials who are not leaders, who are intimidated by the current process and of course will in most cases give in to cowardice in the party line. Secondly, when we educate our citizens on how the redistricting process really works in Pennsylvania, they are both surprised and appalled that such a process could exist in the 21st century. And naturally they're upset that nothing is being done about it. And then thirdly, how can, we, how can we accept the reality that our Harrisburg political leaders, both parties, pretend that the process for redistricting is generally okay and things will work out in the end, when we know in fact that Pennsylvania remains one of the most highly gerrymandered states in our country. So I would ask the LRC, you ladies and gentlemen here, that now is the time to fix our national embarrassment. Let's be transparent with our process at all times, starting today. Be accountable and responsive. Please keep in mind that when we educate our citizens throughout the state, they are appalled and they want to know who's in charge, who's riding, who's driving the bus, and why our political representatives, both reps and senators, are not speaking up on this disgrace. And do the right thing and help get Pennsylvania out of the political dark ages. It's hurting us politically, it's hurting us economically, it's hurting us as a reputation for growth and for engaging and attracting young people and businesses to our state. We are in slow decline, 
And the process that we have today for redistricting only helps accelerate that decline. So make it happen today, open up our redistricting process, keep it open until all of our new maps reflect a gerrymander free representative uh, government and join us as well in 2022 to really impact and provide real reform to our redistricting process come 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Okay. So you've heard from four different people giving testimonies and you've heard them all that they're all different and that's terrific. We don't want them all to be the same. Um, they've touched on economics in different ways. They've touched on um, voting power in different ways. And your job is to think through what do you want to say 